because of its vitality, because of its uh, uh, unique presentation of imagery, and because of the nature of the way it chooses to tell a story, quote unquote, I suddenly got excited about filmmaking again. In this video essay, I want to discuss the camera movement in Mihal Kalatsov's I Am Cuba. This film showcases possibly the best use of camera movement as a character than any other movie. In contrast to classical Hollywood cinematography, which uses static camera shots and reverse shots generally to convey a story, Kalatsov's camera moves in a way that establishes itself as a character in this film as well as a viewer. Unlike many classical films where the camera is positioned as a passive observer, Soy Kuba positions the camera, and by extension the viewer, as an active participant in viewing. The frame is constantly changing through movement, always observing something new. The camera's actions reflect the mood and passion of the scene that's in. The film tells four different stories, each with their own unique camera style reflecting them. In the prologue, for example, the camera moves smoothly, sweeping across the picturesque Cuban landscape below it. This is contrasted by a jarring cut to the chaos of the city with its rooftop parties and jazz music. In the next sequence, the camera's frantic movements reflect the farmer's increasing desperation as he learns he lost his farm. I Am Cuba's narrative, or actually set of narratives, is set in late 1950s Cuba during the final years of the Batista regime. The film as a whole consists of four separate stories. The first takes place in Havana and features a Cuban woman, Betty, who is forced to work as a prostitute to American capitalists. The second transpires in the country and presents the sugarcane farmer, Pedro, who, after years of hard work, decides to burn the fields he works because their local owner has sold them to an American multinational. The third moves back to Havana and portrays the actions of left-wing students and their confrontations with reactionary police forces. The last story takes place again outside the city, this time in the mountains, where a peasant whose idyllic family life is shattered by an air raid joins Castro's revolutionary forces to avenge his son's needless death. These four stories are connected only by a shared female voiceover that repeats I am Cuba throughout, which is the film's very first words. I am Cuba focuses on space as an unfolding agency, not only with its title, The Nation Becomes a Collective Space That Speaks Personhood, but with its first establishing shot, a sweeping aerial view in which the camera glides over the ocean, approaches the island, and moves into the depths, following effortlessly over beaches, trees, rivers, hills, and valleys. People are at first absent, other than the anthropomorphized voice of the island itself. This four-minute opening sequence announces the film as a tale above all spaces and movements, and of human protagonists as they exist within and throughout these. Taking the viewer from gliding motion and soft voiceover narration to erratic movement and blaring jazz, this sudden shift establishes spatial dislocation as the central organizing principle of the film. I Am Cuba's four stories leap radically from the city's view to the country view, to the city view to the country view, mapping Cuba's territory as a dynamic relationship of call and response between its individual sequences, in which the protagonists through space echo and actively comment on one another. Cuba is never merely an isolated place or a static island, but rather movement and dislocation themselves. These cameramen call to attention not just the act of looking, but to the camera's act of looking. That is, how we look at our own experience as cinematic spectators. Kalatsov's hotel rooftop sequence evokes the famous opening long take of Orson Welles' 1958 film Touch of Evil, in which the camera tracks pedestrians and cars for three and a half minutes as they move through the vibrant space of the Mexican-U.S. border. In Wales' opening, the absence of a film cut is set against the dramatic political cut of the border itself, around which the movie story of police corruption and drug trafficking subsequently unfolds. The spatial terms of I Am Cuba's opening rooftop scene are taken up and elaborated in the film's third narrative act, which focuses on Havana's budding student revolutionaries. Enrique, the central student protagonist, has decided to assassinate the city's chief of police against his compatriots' wishes. To do so, he ascends an urban rooftop and retrieves a concealed rifle, and stares down the scope at the chief and his family enjoying breakfast in their domestic garden. Though determined, Enrique is unable to shoot. Confronted with the unexpected presence of the police chief's family and the sudden prospect of actually taking another's life, he throws the rifle aside and frantically descends down the street below. Revolutionary action has been delayed, and arguably deepened, by the narrowing and intensification of his field of view. Space, in a suddenly new form, 
has forced Enrique to newly confront the effects and stakes of his efforts. In an elegantly formulated episode of Spatial Referencing, Enrique's climb directly responds to, even answers, the opening hotel passage, for not only do both sequences feature people scuttling across rooftops, but the respective buildings stand right around the corner from each other, as revealed by the prominent architectural landmark. Beyond such general points of comparison, the scene of Enrique's determined, if ultimately aborted, assassination attempt can be understood as a point-by-point -point reversal of the opening hotel sequence. It moves up rather than down, follows a specific figure rather than being divorced from any identifiable narrative agent, and culminates in movement of resolutely focused critical consciousness, embodied on screen in a point-of-view shot through Enrique's rifle scope. That stands in pointed contrast to the chaotic flux of the underwater descent closing the earlier sequence. While the movement of the hotel guests is random, unmotivated, and set against an open sky, Enrique's rooftop motions are dance-like, set within a structuring grid of rooftop girders and recalling the perfect integration of performer and space in films such as 1940s musicals. These comparisons could go on. The essential point is that Enrique's climb is constructed as an orchestrated tale of spatial passage, one that ends in a movement of literally elevated revolutionary self-consciousness. That can be understood not just as the echo, but actually to correct the spatial inertia or illiteracy of the film's opening hotel sequence. Enrique is engaging space and, moreover, is allowing space to engage him, to change his perception. This pattern of related movements through a distinctive space and the resulting evolutions in cognition, often from chaos to formal self-consciousness, occurs throughout the movie. The film's first narrative passage, for instance, which begins in a claustrophobic Havana nightclub, concludes with an American businessman who, after having slept with a conflicted Cuban prostitute, winds his way home through the city slums. Losing his way and surrounded by widespread destitution and begging children, the passage of the American businessman is shown through what appear to be subjective handheld shots, frenzied and confrontational. The camera moves with a kind of confused lurching that betrays a view both severely circumscribed and motivated by fear and incapacity. He is left aimless and wandering as the sequence ends, with the voice of Cuba chiming in, I am Cuba, as the camera cranes up to an aerial surveying shot. This sequence of unknowing and unresolved spatial passage is then echoed in, and similarly corrected by, the formal procession that closes the film's third narrative, in which Enrique, having been killed by the police chief who Enrique had targeted, is celebrated as a martyr by thousands of solemn marchers. In contrast to the businessman's disoriented and lonely search among disconnected streets, the procession for Enrique is that of multitudes united with adamant purpose to celebrate the martyrdom of a single figure. They realize they have to make, of course they realize they have to make it, uh, they have to tell the story in a very different way. Uh, Kalatatsov uh, decides that it's got to be uh, an epic um, of imagery uh, and poetry. Not, dialogue is not important. Uh, and there'll be no main character going through the different episodes. The main character is the country, the land, the soil, uh, Cuba. And uh, it, it's very exciting because what happens in a moment like that is that you wipe the slate clean and you start with the beginning again of the language of cinema. You just rewrite it. You rewrite it. You recreate it. And uh, no matter what you do, it's not going to be wrong. There's no such thing. Because it comes, out, it comes from a certain place. Uh, because you're redesigning it. You're just saying, okay, this is what cinema is, and this is how the lens could tell this story. And this is how the choreography in front of the lens will be able to give, this, uh, give a story. So, so in a way, it's almost as if they have like a, <laughs> a religious fanaticism 